So character width. Um, we've already seen a lot of this. So just again, uh, if you have a page description, there will be some characters in there. And if you then show that on a page, you get what you see in the, the bottom right corner there. The question that you could ask is, I have these words have been invited there and there is no, so there is a starting point for that sentence, but uh, there is nothing else. So it doesn't say where the A or the V or the E has been drawn. The only thing we have in this text matrix is where the first character goes. So where does that come from? And this is, of course, very similar to what happens in other uh, applications, but there is a little bit of a catch here, as you'll see. If you look at the PDF file, uh, each glyph that has that is in the PDF not only has a, a glyph, so a description of the curves that need to be drawn, it also has a width associated with it, a character width. And these widths are used to position the individual characters. So in the example here, the H will be drawn where it is specified by the text matrix. And then the engine will look at, okay, so what's the width of this age? And it will advance the writing point to include that width. And then it draws the A and it looks for the width of the character A, advances again for that width and it draws the V and so on and so on. Okay. In essence, this is not really complex. And it is exactly the same as what a text editor like Word or InDesign or Quark Express, all of them do that. Um, and usually they have it done by the operating system. So it's relatively easy to do this in a text editor. The problem that you may have in um, PDF is the following. On the left-hand side, you see the metadata associated with a font. On the right-hand side, you see an embedded true type font. Yeah. In a PDF file, both are present. You always have metadata for the font and you might have a, an embedded font. But if you have a PDFX file, for example, you have to have an embedded font. It always has to be there. The problem is that both the metadata in the PDF and the font itself contains width information. Yeah. So it's not just in one place. It is in two different places. And as anyone who has written any kind of software or maintained any kind of system should know, having the same information in two different places is a recipe for disaster because it means that you can have a PDF where something wasn't done completely correctly and where you now have two widths tables that do not give you the same uh, information. And when you look at pre-flight, that is exactly what you sometimes see, that there is a problem with character widths. Yeah. Why is this? Well, perhaps because the software that you use to write the PDF was not correct and was a little bit buggy in some for some fonts, and then it might do something where the character widths are not the same. But more likely, it, the scenario is that Originally it was, it might have been correct, but then someone embedded a font that was previously not embedded or the font was changed. You can also replace fonts in PDF. And at that point, it is more likely to end up with widths in the metadata of the font and widths in the embedded font that no longer match up. And then the question of course is, which of these two pieces of information is going to be used by the pre-flight engine or, or in fact by the engine that draws these characters on screen. And that is why in modern uh, pre-flight profiles, you very often have a rule that says character widths are not the same uh, and that is a potential problem. Yeah. So I tried to keep it a little bit shorter. Uh, again, it's a, a rather technical issue but it is one that you often see in pre-flight uh, errors, and it always indicates that there is a problem in the font. You can try to uh, you can try to correct it by uh, taking the information from the font, for example, and replacing what you have in the metadata, or vice versa. 
But of course, that by itself also comes with a risk because you're changing the PDF and you don't know what happened to this PDF in the past. You can't know which of these two with tables is actually correct. So if you get this, uh, this, this error message, yes, you might try to correct it, but this is a case where I would not only correct it, I would also be very, very careful in checking afterwards that you didn't break the position of the characters on the page, uh, for example. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, we just got a question now. I was about to say no questions. Uh, when you mean bad software, do you also include font management software? Uh, I'm a developer. I don't trust any software. Um, <laughs> But essentially, yes, I think by now, if you sat through this, this presentation, I think by now you realize there are lots of moving parts when it comes to fonts. And it is very easy to, to make a mistake somewhere. In fact, if you would critically, uh, well, let's put it differently, if you would pre-flight uh, PDF files and you would fail PDF files on any defect in embedded fonts, so any point where the font doesn't obey the actual standard, what you would find is that you probably have to fail 90% of the PDF files out there. Um, there are many fonts that have problems. In many cases, it's, it's trivial problems that don't really have much risk, but yeah, it's a difficult field. So yes, absolutely, the font management software could get it wrong as well. Uh, but the most of the problems I've seen are either because the font writing software, so the, the one that generates the file, did something wrong or the, the file was post-processed by other tools and there is some clash between what tool A did and then what tool B does afterwards. Mm -hmm.